It's a great honour to stand in next to Yvonne Rogers, who is a professor at University College in London, and her talk will be about human-centred uh, learning tools empowering versus analysing students. And we've all been aware of ChatGPT and similar kind of technologies, and lots of people are really worried about this. And she will give her critical perspective whether we should be worried about this or whether we actually should embrace this as teacher. So Yvonne is a director of the Interactive Center of UCL. I think you pronounce it UCLIC, or is it not UCLIC? Yeah. And she's also the deputy head of the Department of Computer Science and Computer and a professor of interactive design. Her research is in the area of HEI, ubiquitous computing and interaction design. And um, I, you probably don't realize this. If you Google Scholar her, I mean, the numbers that she has is absolutely beyond belief. But I think what's really amazing is we're standing next to a person who has a ACM Chi Lifetime Achievement Award, a Royal Society Robin Milner Medal. She is an MRC Suffrage and Science Award, and she is a fellow of the Royal Society. So we're standing really next to someone who is an amazing academic. She previously worked in the US at Indiana State, and she also worked at the Open University. So that must be an amazing person to work with. So without further ado, I'm really honored to welcome Professor Yvonne Rogers. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me up there? Um, I'm going to keep the best to the last. And um, I'll start off by um, talking um, a bit about learning analytics and um, then I will talk a bit about some of my research and then I'll end with talking about chat GPT. But um, I always like to do a bit of research uh, when I'm giving a talk at a conference that I'm not a, a member of. So I had a, a read, or a scan should I say, of a paper by Neil Selwyn and Dragan Gassevich um, on learning analytics that they did during the pandemic. I don't know if either of them are here today. Um, and uh, it was fascinating to see that they had an email debate for six months going backwards and forwards between different perspectives. And it was music to my ears to see that one of the definitions they give is understanding and optimizing learning and learning environments with a clear focus on improving learning. And I couldn't agree more. And where, where our, my perspective is, is from a human-computer interaction and very much in terms of designing new technology. So what I try to do is enhance and inspire learning through innovative technology. And I have done that for the last 20 or so years. Um, so that's, I'm taking that perspective, um, but uh, bearing in mind this is what, to me, learning analytics um, at a broad level. I'm sure there are many other ways of thinking about it. So for my talk, um, as I said, I'm going to talk a bit about what I've been doing, and which is how do we design new tools to empower learning. And I'll talk about two core or fundamental design principles which have been very much at the backbone of, of my research, which is feedback and scaffolding. And then we'll finish off, so hopefully it will lead into a debate, to think, rethink how we teach our kids and how we do assessments in the era of generative AI, given that that's what is happening at the moment. So it probably, uh, I don't really need to say this, but I think central to learning is, is how we give feedback. Um, as a professor, I'm always dreading all the marking I have to do when they, or the assignments arrive because I have 100 essays or 100 reports and it can be soul destroying. But I know for my students, they crave feedback, whether it's uh, a mark or the written comments. And uh, so um, they wait with bated breath. And perhaps one of the, the biggest uh, criticisms we get in our teaching is that they don't get enough feedback, they don't get it in time. Um, and uh, what it is is that we can give marks, scores, we can give uh, written feedback, but we also meet with the students um, to discuss their feedback with them. And I think this is central to them being able to reflect on how well they're doing and, and so on. So most of it is in a written form. But during the pandemic, uh, we all had to start using different tools uh, for our teaching. And one I think that was most successful uh, were some online uh, tools uh, that allowed multiple people to work together. 
And uh, I don't know how many of you used Miro, but this proved to be highly successful in how we adapted it for our teaching when we were doing online teaching. And it provides a number of creative tools for diagramming, sketching, drawing, doing uh, mind mapping, which is a, you know, um, an important part of many students' learning, and the use of flowcharts. And you can just keep growing and growing what it is that you create on, on these digital um, whiteboards. And we used it in our teaching. And I think one of the, the most powerful things about this is how we could give feedback to each other. So one of my colleagues, Nick McQuart, teaches a course in interaction design. And each year he asks them to uh, come up with a project where they have to ideate and design a poster. And the poster has to be to redesign an everyday, the interface of an everyday object. And he collects all of these posters that they, they um, are from each year and they're available to the students to have a look at. And they line up their posters and then during a session they all look at each other's posters. And one of the key things they do is they provide feedback to each other through digital post-it notes. So the yellow ones are the students' feedback and the orange ones are the tutors' feedback. And uh, during a, a, a two-hour session, the students go from one post to another, they'll look at them and, they'll look, and then they'll add feedback or they'll, the tutors will add it as well. And what we found was that this process of learning how to give feedback and to receive it was a very powerful way of learning in this context of, of online learning. And when we asked the students afterwards, they said it gave a sense of, of being in a place together um, and that they could work simultaneously. They could go zooming into each other's posters. They could also look at the posters from the previous year and the year before that. And it gave them this sense um, of great awareness of each other and each other's activities that they didn't have um, through doing it just um, physically. So there was something about the pandemic that was actually very positive in terms of providing this feedback and, and a new way of learning. And I think the bottom line here is that providing feedback um, is just as important as, as receiving it. And we did give the students um, instructions on how to be constructive and not just say, what's that? Or, you know, they had to think about how it's best to give feedback. And as we know, that students all crave positive feedback. So you give them good feedback, and then you have to say, well, perhaps you could improve upon something. But here, what was really key was this use of digital post-it notes on top of the work that they created. And just to recap, it enabled the students to compare all of the different tutors' feedback and the students' feedback on their work. And this helped them to reflect in situ and to improve their designs. It also gave the students confidence, a new skill, which is to learn how to give feedback to other students. And that's a really important skill. And as I said, to learn to give feedback is, is as important as receiving it. These are students at a university. What happens if giving feedback is, is really difficult for very young children? How do, they, how do you give feedback to them and how do they receive feedback? And part of my early research has been thinking about novel ways of providing feedback. And we were invited, I often get invited by people in the arts, the entertainment and culture um, to, to work with them. And I was invited to try and uh, work with the education specialists at a theatre company in London um, called the Fevered Sleep. And they work in what's called the Young Vic. And they develop all of these interactive performances um, to encourage children to look around, to see the world, to think about it. And, um, and the way in which they do this is they create these immersive um, experiences. So this particular performance involved a protagonist going through this red door into the forest and seeing stars and all sorts of wild and wonderful animals. And the children, who are aged four to seven, uh, were all given a tail to wear and uh, every now and again they'd be sitting on the floor they'd start dancing um, and they followed this particular character on his journey and it was an hour long performance for kids of that age it's quite amazing to keep their attention for so long but what they found really difficult was how do they know whether the kids understood enjoyed well they probably know how they enjoy it but what they did get from this kind of interactive immersive experience 
And that's where we came in. We were asked to come up with a novel way of getting feedback from children. So how did we do this? Well, we didn't just design a, an online questionnaire. <laughs> we designed what we called small talk. And this is a set of tangible boxes for children to answer questions and to reflect on the interactive performance that they've been through. And I had at the time some very creative uh, designers and engineers working in my team, and they built these uh, boxes here, which had buttons and spinners and microphones and videos appearing. Any ideas that the children would come up to each one and uh, touch the buttons or answer questions through these? So the first box, just our simple demographic, like how old are you? Did you come with your school or your family? And if the children couldn't speak, sorry, if they couldn't read, uh, it, they could press a button and it would speak to them. So here they are, all queuing up after they've been to see the performance, answering at each of the boxes. They were delighted to be able to stand and answer in this way and to spin and to press the buttons. I'm not going to go through each of um, the boxes, but just go to the last one, which was perhaps the one that really probed them which was to uh, have the protagonist appear as a video at eye level and asking them direct questions. And they had to reply by speaking into that big microphone on the right there. And questions like, hey, it's so good to see you again. What did you see? You were watching me on my journey. What did I do? Um, Some things on my journey made me sad. What made me sad? So quite probing questions for the kids of that age. And what we found was that uh, we, we, we uh, put this, set this up after a number of performances. There will be about uh, 15 or so children at each performance. And most of the children provided spoken answers. The ones who didn't were the very youngest. They still found it quite hard. But they were quite reflective and thoughtful. And they mentioned lots of things uh, that they saw in the production. They said things about their emotional um, experiences, like how excited or how silly they felt or how happy. And then they also mentioned some aspect of the journey um, the protagonist went on, uh, where there was a boat trying to find family and so on, and what made him sad. And I think if we reflect on this type of approach to getting feedback, it's, it's quite embodied, and, and the educationalists found it really insightful. They've had a real struggle getting feedback from kids, and they were able to glean more about very young children's perceptions and their level of engagement and what actually happened, and that the kids actually talked about specific things rather than, yes, I liked it, or no, I didn't like it. And as you saw in that photo, there was quite a lot of over-the-shoulder watching and how that influences choices. We also saw that with Miro, where the students were watching other students giving feedback. And that's a very powerful way of, of thinking about um, feedback. So just before the pandemic, we were asked again, I'm very into designing tangible boxes, and I've done many. But this one we developed um, called Eval Me. And this is a device that we developed for teenagers to provide feedback on their experience and this was um, developed as a way again to get over using just these sort of online surveys that uh, you ask at the end of a class or a workshop and the way in which it works is quite simple is that children are asked a series of questions in this case it's three and there are these knobs here which they can turn from one to twelve and one light one led will light up um, depending on what that stands for that can be uh, really disagree, uh, to really agree being the 12. And the templates can be changed between sessions. Um, they're just under that Perspex glass. So this is how it works in... in uh, so they're answering a question here of, is data is something I can play with? And that's uh, they're lighting up there. And this one is, information about me is valuable, but obviously not for that person. And I'm having fun. And so it's simple as that. So how did we use this type of uh, feedback device? Well, um, what we were asked at this time was to work with a, um, someone who was teaching computing, coding, and in particular part of the curriculum in the UK, which is uh, some of the more difficult topics, which is the number systems. 
or concepts. And we had someone who was from the, the dance school who was teaching dance. And what they did was they brought them together, those kids who are into dance and kids who are into mus um, maths and computing. And what we wanted to try and do was to uh, develop a workshop where all of the kids got really excited by learning about the maths and also the, the dance. And then we used the Avow Me system as a way of getting feedback from them. But just to give you a sense of um, the workshop that we developed, it was called Data Moves. This one has a battery, a charger, and all the other necessary components inside it. So that means we could actually visualize body movement in space. So since this one's only capable of displaying a movement in a single, single location, we use these base stations that have um, eight time of flight sensors. The range of these sensors is four meters. That means if this is put on the floor, we have a diameter of eight meters that people could stand around. Um, and then we can visualize sound, different visuals, and how people just traverse space overall. Working with Sue, I think we're going to combine movement and this uh, physical computing tool uh, uh, to create a workshop. And the workshop's going to be based around data visualization, binary, and data representation for key stage three students. We're going to further develop that workshop uh, with Studio Wayne McGregor and um, Suzanne from UCL. And uh, then we're going to be delivering that in December to students. Yes. We hope the outcomes are an increased ability to understand these key stage three concepts, um, to learn and embed what are sometimes very abstract concepts and sometimes, sometimes very thing, things that are very tough to wrap your head around. But hopefully through the movement and through these tools, we're able to kind of create some more ways in. Key stage three is the part where students will be making decisions about their next steps in their education um, and a lot of the time they feel that computing isn't something that's relevant to them or interesting to them and hopefully presenting it in a completely different way will show them that actually it can be really creative, um, it can inform decisions about what they might do in other areas of their, um, their interests, sports, um, drama, music, music um, choreography, art, uh, all sorts of areas um, so it connects in really nicely with all sorts of things. I think it's also important to say that if, um, if dance will help more girls be interested in computing, then perhaps computing with dance um, will help more boys be interested in dance. It's very intellectual and I like the fact that it crosses over with um, technology because it shows people that dance isn't just about the dancing, it's the, it also connects into lots of other, um, other areas and subject areas.
technology to encourage children to explore these mun uh, number concepts through exploring data visualizations, but we're also interested in how you could um, explore uh, number concepts through, in um, particular binary and deanery, through designing patterns of dance. And one of the things we did was we spent a lot of time doing co-design, where it wasn't us as the researchers telling the, the others um, who were the teachers um, and all um, how to um, use the technology. It was very much them talking with us. So we spent a lot of time structuring and scaffolding uh, the activities that would take place. So they'd have some theory, they'd be able to explore the wearable devices we developed um, to look at the data visualizations. They then had to do some, some of their own work. So it was a real mix of things. And then we wanted to work out which of these they enjoy most, which they struggle with, uh, which were challenging. And that's where our EvalMe tool came into action. So we talked a bit about when should we ask the students what they thought. Should it be right at the end of the workshop, which is typical, or at the end of each activity? And in the end, we agreed to um, have the students use our EvalMe box um, after three of the, the sessions. And so you can see them using it here. And what, again, is happening is very much looking at what the other kids are doing when answering the questions and talking about it. And compared to ticking boxes um, in a survey when you're giving feedback, interacting with that EvalMe box slowed down students' thinking. They really did think about their answers. They were contemplating, did I enjoy this? What did I think of data? And they were comparing with the other kids. The teachers, however, thought it took too long for them to answer, but it actually gave the students breathing time because the teachers like to you know, pack in as much as possible. We also uh, observed that um, some of the kids were very happy uh, giving their uh, responses publicly, whilst others wanted to do it uh, privately. So one of the students who was in the workshop, who didn't make any eye contact with anyone and seemed quite disengaged throughout the workshop, took the box away and started to give quite a lot of feedback um, in the corner to the point where we had to ask him to come back and give us the box back. But I think what we found was that this way of giving feedback was very effective uh, for the kids to reflect. At the end, we got them all to sit down and we showed the data that has been collected through this EvalMe box as a summary of bar charts. And you can see one of them here. So they could see how all of the kids had responded for the different questions. Um, and they sat around and they found it quite difficult to comment on the data. And part of this was that they, it's an unfamiliar task in getting kids in situ in public to talk about the data that they'd given. And they went very shy and quiet. And it was only when uh, my researcher, uh, Susan Leckelt, um, led them through each of these bar charts that they started to get more engaged and, and think a bit more. And they discussed some of the questions um, and drew conclusions, but she really had to lead them through the data in that way. But I'd just like to say that this way of thinking differently about feedback um, through the tangible devices has been a very powerful way of, of thinking um, about getting the kids to reflect. But, as you know from being a part of this community, data visualizations are a very powerful form of feedback for assessing students' performance over time. Now, this is a graph that one of my colleagues gave me. I was just telling her that uh, when we went for a walk, that this is what they use to assess their students and to give them feedback. You can see there, these are for different courses, and you can see the average, um, which is the bar, and then the red line, which is that particular student, whether they're above and below. And this enables them over uh, the years to see how they're improving. And so that's something that has been very valuable for educators. So you can get um, uh, see progress and steer their learning paths and next steps. But I also think that we should be thinking about how to give and receive feedback the students themselves to be able to act it out, be able to share and look over the shoulder um, helps them in their learning and it's, and it's a very powerful way of learning. So how can we combine these two types of feedback in future AI tools? And in particular with machine learning, how can we use that 
uh, to provide different types of feedback uh, when kids are learning specific kinds of skills and if so how and I've been working in the last few years with a company who are a startup called Emotech and in the last few years they've developed all sorts of technologies one was a robot but the one that I'm going to talk about today was an AI based learning tool to help Chinese students to pronounce English um, Chinese students often have problems um, stressing the right, uh, um, the right stresses in um, a sentence. They may get the syllables okay, but not the right rhythm. And what they wanted to do was to provide them with a tool to help them pronounce certain stresses. And the way in which this tool works is it compares video and audio recordings of sentences a teacher speaks who has the right pronunciation uh, with how well a student mimics them. I should say, to say that the people who are part of Emotech are Chinese, so have had that experience themselves. And the way in which it works is it detects the mispronunciations by using machine learning algorithms, and it looks at the mouth shape and the pitch of the syllables and the vowels and the way they're spoken, facial movements when speaking, and also, as I said, detecting these mispronunciations. And um, I'm going to play a video so you get a sense of how the, the tool works in practice and how the, the importance of the feedback here. The lessons into a new era. Our text-to-video technology can easily convert any written English into animation of the teachers that has accurate lip movement. Stephen Stephen lives, lives in a village. village. After this, the video demonstration and creates the class through the teacher management platform. Students can scan the QR code to start the exercise. I can't breathe, breathe in the clothes. I can't breath in the, in the clothes. I can't breath in the clothes. Breath. Breathe. Breath. They can practice this individually with the help of multimodal AI phoneme level scoring and watch the playback of the lip pronunciation. And breathe in the clothes. After completing all exercises, the system will generate a personalized course report based on every student's performance. During, during the practice, the teacher can check the learning progress in real time according to the high frequency mistakes that are summarized by the system to give a targeted explanation. You do use it on their smartphone a sentence, uh, in this way, so the brass felt cold against my hand, and then the student uh, records themselves on the smartphone saying the same sentence, and then it compares, and then gives feedback on uh, how each word has been pronounced, whether it's uh, matches or whether it's uh, a mispronunciation. And this type of red, yellow, green feedback can be highly effective for specific words and to keep practicing, practicing those. Um, and so it's been found that for Chinese students, they find this way of practicing can help them with the pronunciation of certain words. And then for the teachers, they've got this type of dashboard uh, that can show for each student how much they've improved. So it provides both feedback for both. From a human-computer interaction perspective, um, these types of new AI learning tools, I think, ask, raise some really important questions about how do you present the feedback? to enhance or support the learning. Is it immediate? Is it delayed? Um, is it composite? Do you provide lots of feedback or do you break it down? And as you saw there, it's, it's broken down by each sentence. And then do you use certain types of signaling like the traffic lights, red, yellow, green, um, or the five stars, which you've all become familiar with, as a quick way of giving feedback as to how well they're doing? And then what are the most meaningful dashboards for teachers? So that one was a standard dashboard where you can just see for each student. Then there's the content to practice in this, in this particular learning tool. Is, do you provide textbook sentences? Do you provide jokes? We know humor is very good at uh, helping students become engaged in, in the content. 
Do you provide tongue twisters, everyday narratives, or um, other types of content? And then there's the question of how to design the interface. What is the best teacher face to look at when practicing? Should it be the whole face um, or just the mouth so they can look at the way the mouth is? And should it be real or cartoon-like avatar? And some of my students have been looking at these types of questions as to whether it makes a difference or a, has an impact. So that's the whole face. Or do you just present the mouth so you can just focus on, on that? Do you have a cartoon avatar uh, that um, is easy on the eyes? Or do you have a lifelike avatar which can be quite stern to look at? Um, and I think these are important questions and we have found that there is some differences that they prefer a cartoon like, at least in the user studies we, we ran. Then there are many other types of questions. Things like do you show the same or different feedback to students who are quick to learn versus those who struggle to, to learn. And how you present that feedback to the students at the interface I think is key to keeping them going. So I've just given you some examples of how we can think of deep feedback differently. Second part of my talk is to look at um, how we might think of scaffolding and designing uh, different interfaces, in particular chatbots. So how we might improve learning through scaffolding, um, uh, through using chatbots. So what do we mean by scaffolding? I had the great pleasure of meeting uh, Jerry Bruner a, a few times, um, and uh, most recently, before he died a few years ago in New York. And I've read a lot of his work. I've been very inspired uh, by his work in education. But just for today, we'll take the well-known definition. The scaffolding refers to the steps taken to reduce the degrees of freedom in carrying out some tasks so that the child can concentrate on the difficult task they are in the process of acquiring. And so to think about how you might help them in those difficult tasks. And the one that I've been looking at is how do you help uh, people to make sense of data visualizations? It's just a coincidence that this conference also is very much concerned with data visualizations. Um, and um, to think a bit about how you might help scaffold in that process. And I will start by drawing on the work that has been done in the intelligent tutoring systems um, field, which has been, again, to think about how you scaffold um, at the interface students to learn by simulating holding a conversation with the learner and to give feedback and, and ask questions. One of the earliest uh, types of um, tutors that has followed this approach was auto tutor. How many of you are familiar with this? Some of you are. It's, this is one of the earlier versions, and I'm sure it's much improved, but it's based on having different windows uh, by which a student can learn. So on the left is a bit of a scary looking avatar. <laughs> it was one of the earlier avatars, but maybe sometimes having a scary looking teacher can be motivated. Possibly, we've covered this and we're pretty well, but something is missing. Is there anything you can add to that? That is scary. Um, and <laughs> the way she blinks her eyes. Let's see if I can help you. How can the word processing program operate efficiently? So you can see that she's answering uh, and, and the student is typing in their response and then on, on the right is a, an image. And it's about how does the operating system uh, interact with word processing program? Uh, quite a bit. An important question there. Um, and um, maybe. maybe it is, yeah. I know you can do it. Okay, I think let's that's... keep working and get through this. Let's try this. Okay. We're, she's she's quite good. <laughs> <laughs> but can we design newer types of uh, conversational agents and chatbots that will be perhaps more friendly or more motivating to um, support learning? And independent of this approach, I've been working uh, on how we design chatbots at the interface um, on a project called the VoiceViz project. And we've been working with uh, clinicians at a, a hospital in London, the Great Ormond Street Hospital, who are overwhelmed by new amounts of data that arrived. And they want to be able to help train their clinicians to be able to look at the data and to analyze it um, and to be able to make sense of complex health data. 
So that's where we come in is to start thinking about, well, can we scaffold, can we provide chatbots? So whilst this wasn't specifically for educational settings, I think a lot of what we did is relevant to uh, educational settings. So we developed an interface agent called Visi, and Visi was designed not to have a, a, a heart-to-heart -heart conversation, but to probe uh, the clinicians to talk with one another. So the idea is that they'd be in a meeting together, face to face, they could have been online, and that the, the chatbot would probe them to, and push them to have um, more conversations. So in some ways to facilitate the sense making and, and guide them where to look in the data. So this is a typical data visualization they might have to look at with different um, uh, graph lines here to think what's causing this trend to go up and down. Um, so the scaffolding uh, agent, we spend a lot of time thinking about, well, how do they probe? What questions should they ask? And we thought, well, what we want is to prompt pu um, teams of people to, to think a bit about uh, data uh, and to help them when they appear to be stuck. And we did this by asking open-ended questions such as, do you need a hint for analysing X? What do you think of this? Shall we move on? Did you consider the difference between variable X and Y? And what might have caused the sudden spike? So being open-ended was to try and get uh, the humans themselves to answer the questions rather than trying to replace them. So the data that we worked with was um, obesity data. And obesity is a big problem worldwide. And this is 30 years of data that they had access to and for different demographics. So for girls and um, boys, uh, women and men, for adults and children, for developing and developed countries. And you can see that they can have a, a, you know, a straight line increase there or it can be sudden in increase. And in HCI, we tend to run lots of studies, user studies, by using what's called a Wizard of Oz technique. And that's where you don't try and build the system up front beforehand, but you get a human to pretend to be uh, the, the uh, AI um, agent. And they can then press buttons at appropriate times and give certain prompts. And we had to come up with rules for when our Wizard of Oz would um, provide these prompts during the discussions that were being had by the, the teams. And to begin, we just had two simple rules. One was a team hasn't discussed a pattern or trend being referred to. And the second was there was a silence for at least three seconds, as, as if they appeared to be stuck. So this is how it worked. Fizzy was um, embedded in a data analytics software tool and it could appear as a chatbot or as um, um, speech to a smart speaker. And we did look at differences, but I don't have time today to go through uh, whether having a voice or having it appear as text on a screen makes a difference. It does make quite a difference. What I want to just say today is that having this type of uh, probing uh, chatbot encouraged the team to generate more hypotheses about the, the trends they were seeing in the data. And it did this by getting them to focus on the causes behind the different ways the lines um, increased in the graphs. And here's a quote which I think uh, it really sums that up. I like that the questions were on finding out more about the data. By answering the question, or even by looking at it, you would think about the consequences. And then you would ask yourself, why is this line more steady than the others, which wouldn't necessarily happen without the assistant? And here's an example of the type of discussion that would go on in, in one of our um, studies. So there's a silence, and Vizzy would prompt up, uh, pop up with this prompt. What might have caused the sudden spike? So looking at this here. And then the conversation was possi you know, possibly it was globalization, getting lots of different foods, uh, obviously electronics, computers, playstations, so children play less outside and get overweight, and so on and so forth. And so Vizzy here was triggering and prompting them to think a bit more deeply about what were the causes of some of these um, changes in, in trends. So just to summarize, um, for this um, design principle, thinking very much about scaffolding, when you design it as a probing sort of chatbot um, that can be embedded in the software, I think it can facilitate um, that type of learning by triggering more 
ideation and exploration of the data and it can lead to better understanding and decision making. But importantly what we found was it sparked more in-depth conversations between group members. So if you put that into an educational context it could also be the case that we could get have these kinds of prompts within a classroom to, to trigger kids um, talking to each other more. Um, so that's the hope. Okay, so the final part of my talk that you've all been waiting for is the future of generative AI tools in learning. We've all read and heard in the last few months um, a lot about uh, chat GPT. How many of you haven't used the tool yet? Not used it? One of you. <laughs> Two of you. Okay, so you, you're all aware. aware. Um, how many of you have not read anything about chat GPT? You've all read about it. So you know that there's lots of uh, discussions about the pros and cons, and it's raising the bar to what is possible in terms of how you write and think. Most students, if not all students, are already using chat GPT. When I talk to my students, they'll say, yeah, what's the big deal? It's a bit like using a calculator. They're aware of its potential and its limitations. And in the last month or so, the International Baccalaureate um, has already accepted that it can be used. Um, so it's, it's there. The genie is out of the bottle. It's not going back in again. So we need to think about how can we use these types of new tools to transform learning in new directions. So in a way in which we try to use chat uh, bots to encourage more discussion, perhaps we can facilitate using these, the art of debate and more discussion, and get students to think differently and even brilliantly through using these. And some of you might be much more sceptical, and I think it's important to have both sides of the argument. So I have read uh, also articles that think it's a disaster in the making. There's a paper in a, a new pamphlet that's come out uh, uh, called um, Perspectives on um, Generative AI. And Rob Reich um, wrote this month um, this article. I don't think the person is in the audience here. Anyway, he is saying how learning to write um, better is inseparable from learning to think better. And if we rely more and more on these types of tools to write, students will not learn themselves to express their thoughts when writing, and their thoughts will become less clear or less cohesive. Some of us might think, is that possible? But um, he then goes on to say that, that if text models are doing the writing, then students aren't learning to think. And um, I would say that he's got a point. Uh, we uh, do have a propensity to get lazy. But it's up to us to think about how we can encourage students to think and write more um, using these types of tools. So I set myself a task thinking about this um, and took an essay title that we set for our MSc students who do a course in human computer interaction. Uh, and the course is on future interfaces. And one of the essays that they set has this title, or at least it did, which is what key technology innovations do you envision appearing in our homes or and our local communities in 2035. In what specific ways do you think these will transform the way we live? What would be the main challenges? You know, a nice essay title that we set, gets them to think, gets them to do research. So what I did was put that into ChatGPT, and within two minutes it came back with this essay, which is pretty reasonable. It talks about three different types of technologies that could transform the way we live. One is um, autonomous vehicles. Another is augmented and virtual reality, and a third one is home automation systems. And it gives the pros and cons. And you think, well, if one of my students had written that, except we do ask them for 2,000 words, not 500, it's quite impressive. But then if you look a bit deeper, you start to see some patterns in the way in which the sentences are written. So the first one talks about autonomous vehicles. This could transform the way we live by dot, dot, dot. However, the main challenge would include dot, dot, dot. For the second one, it says, this could transform the way we experience entertainment, education, and social. However, the main challenges would include addressing concerns about privacy, dot, dot, dot. The third one, same thing, same pattern. This could transform the way we manage our homes, however, and it becomes very pattern-based, the way it's written. There's no personal feel feeling in it. And so what we need to think about is, why not let students go and um, ask ChatGPT to write these types of essays? 
Um, but then to have a conversation with them, a bit like a chatbot. So ask them to, um, uh, about its reply. Yeah. Where did they get the evidence for this essay? Uh, could they provide the, the references? Um, and could it write a more in-depth essay? What questions would they ask it? That's the student, and why? So starting getting them to do, develop these metacognitive skills, if you like. Then get them to do some fact-checking on the points made by ChatPT. As you know, it can hallucinate. It can come up with all sorts of nonsense. So why not try and you know, get it to you know, do some fact-checking, find where it's made a mistake or um, said something. One of my students uh, tried it out and said, what is Yvonne Rogers famous for? And it came back with a paper written in 1999 on emotional interfaces. I have never written a paper on emotional interfaces, but it was from Rosalind Picard. And I'm sure Rosalind Picard was probably a bit, you know, would be a bit miffed if she knew that I had got her fame <laughs> through ChatGPT. Anyway, that's by the by. Um, I think what we can do is to try and get the students to get ChatGPT to make an error. How do you get it to make an error? How do you get it to hallucinate? How do you know when it's hallucinating? Um, and then uh, come up with counter arguments to what it's just said. You just said what these are the challenges, but what, is the, what are the benefits? And then get ChatGPT to assess their responses and provide feedback on how they could do better. So I think there's lots of ways in which we can start to develop our assessments of um, writing. Um, it could be also for co writing code um, in the future, so that they start to develop these more uh, critical thinking skills. And that's something that are, you know, some of my students find they struggle with. If we can start them at a young age and work through this, I think, you know, I would say that we could probably help students to think better. So finally, as time is coming to an end, Simon, I don't know where he is, he's somewhere in the audience. Um, is a former colleague of mine uh, at the Open University when I was there and when he was there. And I came across one of his blogs and he was talking about how uh, students will use AI tools. And it was, again, music to my ears. He says he sees new AI tools as a form of scaffolding and refers to not uh, Jerry Bruner's or Vygotsky, but to Schoen's work, uh, which is very much talking about reflection in action uh, by the learner, possibly also with peers, and the teaching coaching team. And the idea here is that they can develop the capacity uh, to engage in more nuanced, um, more developed reflection in action using these tools by making improve, improvised decisions. So I think we're on the same wavelength here, which is to think about how we can develop learning tools that somehow embed this type of scaffolding. And for us to think about how we can scaffold our assessments uh, by which to get students to be more critical. So the way forward, uh, coming to the end of my talk now, is let's think about designing a future generation of AI tools that both challenge and empower learners to be more creative, to be critical, and to be thoughtful. And that let's think a bit more about how we can provide innovative new forms of feedback and scaffolding through these tools. And I've shown you Today, some of the attempts or ways in which we've tried to do that. And within human-computer interaction, there's always lots of new design challenges. And one of them, I think, is where we can work together, the different communities, is to try and think about how we augment human-human conversations. So a lot of uh, research on intelligent tutoring systems has been about one individual and, and the system trying to help them to learn. But I think in the future, let's try and think about groups collaborative learning and to trigger different ways of learning and then to model new kinds of human AI conversation uh, where the AI knows when to explain, when to step back, when to suggest. What we don't want is another uh, generation of Clippies where Clippy, if you remember Microsoft, was one of the first interfaces at the uh, first agents at the interface that would say to you, looks like you're writing a letter, can I provide you with a template? Um, so we need to avoid getting annoying or getting in people's faces with these new types of tools. And to get students to think for themselves more by exploring what has not been said by chat GPT. So finally, one of the things I'm most passionate about is that learning should have joy and fun. 
And you can see on this student's face, I've done a lot of work on physical computing where they learn about uh, electronics and, and computing through using these toolkits. But you can see here, she's got this sense of achievement uh, that she's done something that she didn't think she could. So let's bring back this joy and curiosity to encourage more thinking with new technology tools. And I'd like to thank all my colleagues over the years who've worked with me in this. And thank you very much for being a great audience. I think it depends on the context. Uh, it's a bit like you know, giving kids rewards. Do you give them immediately or do you delay it? And it's, I think if you're learning certain specific skills, like I showed, immediate feedback can be very useful. But if you're uh, learning a, you know, to write an essay, um, maybe just waiting a bit, because we need to do the marking, um, <laughs> isn't such a bad thing. So I, I don't think it's uh, one or the other. I think it really depends if, uh, you know, if it's a specific skill you're trying to practice. So when you're learning to play a musical instrument or learning a language, I think immediate feedback can be very good. And to learn is short, that's at least some of the research I've been looking at, short bursts rather than have hour long. But um, yes, it will depend. Right. Who wants to raise a question? Just mention your name and then away from Oh, hi, it's Simon from EU in the UK, and um, I wanted to ask about the Emotech um, uh, example with the, you were comparing cartoon avatars to the more realistic ones, I, was, I felt like those realistic ones were falling into the uncanny valley, I expect half the less probably in that moment as well as um, tonight, so I was wondering whether you also compared those to just real people. Um, obviously, that is not stable, um, so <laughs> I know it's not a good solution, but just in terms of, I think we will potentially get past the end kind of money at some point, so it'd be interesting to know whether that is worth pursuing. That's a very good question. Uncanny Valleys was, uh, came about um, in, as a concept in Japan in the 80s when some of those lifelike robots were built and they appeared to be slightly human but not human and it made it feel creepy. And as you saw in, in uh, one of the images we used there of a, a lifelike person, it, it, wasn't, it didn't seem quite lifelike enough. And I think as, as we develop the technology for more, uh, you know, for simulating humans in these, in these avatars, we will get to the point where it's still uncanny valley, but after that they could look so human-like or, or we get so used to them that it doesn't matter anymore. I think um, we haven't done that research of comparing real humans uh, because we were interested in it being developed as a software tool. We, it wasn't as dramatic as we thought. Uh, I think people like to see the whole face, um, but also you know, sometimes they like to just look at the, the, the facial expressions and, and the mouth in particular. And so I think they, they actually said that they felt more comfortable having the whole head than just the mouth itself. In terms of the cartoon, I think the cartoon can exaggerate certain uh, ways the mouth moves. So they're quite nuanced how they, how they differ, but I think definitely uh, as we, you know, the graphics improve and the way in which we do the sort of modeling of the way the face moves, we will just get used to it and we will wonder whether or not, is this a real person or not? And I think that will be really interesting when we get past that, so thank you. This is Yanushi from Ansys State University. So, yeah, great talk, thank you. Um, I'm excited about the final discussion about the future AI tools and the generated uh, AI tools part. Um, and I'd also like to go to some of the sessions to learn about their uh, perspectives. Uh, but uh, what I want to ask is like, uh, what do you think about the role of education in the scale of AI interactions? For example, can we just design some sort of like curriculum or workshop to teach students about how to use the AI tools ethically 
uh, would that be necessary in the future of the education or at least some awareness of this? Uh, but we don't, we don't control that microphone, question. we don't have a mind. Should we teach kids to okay. use these so tools ethically? We know kids do whatever they want and they'll test the system. So when some of our earlier educational tools were developed, uh, they you know, use some sensing tools and they go out and sense the environment. The first thing they do is they sense themselves to see. We like to test the system, but I also think we, we do have a, you know, we, we do need to teach them ethics, but we need to teach it in a way that's interesting to them, and I think at the moment it's rather dull how we teach ethics, because we haven't really done it before, so we have relied on uh, philosophy and certain examples, like the trolley example, which is, you know, it's good to start with, but I think there's, there's got to be other ways in which we can teach them about fairness, about trustworthiness, and about, um, you know, if they find something shocking, what do they do when they, something appears? So all of that, I think, is, you know, we, we as a society have to uh, think more about how children, um, when they find information online or when they use these tools, what do they do with that? And that is a big discussion to be had, um, and I don't know the answer to that, but it, 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 is, a, it is a big uh, issue that's going to get bigger. Hello. Phil Winnie from Simon Fraser University in Canada. Do you perceive differences between to and fro of a conversation and feedback? Um, I understood the question was. It was can I tell me? Can I say the difference between two? To and fro in a com. Oh yeah, to and fro, and um, feedback. I just got the wrong type of feedback there. <laughs> <laughs> I think that it, there's been a lot of research done in conversations about turn taking and the importance of promoting turn taking. Um, and uh, what we've been looking at. Um, Didn't happen before. Turn, turn, turn the lab mic off and just use the podium. That might, that might fix it. Turn this one off. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is, I'm sure, and you probably have some answer yourself. But I think for the purpose of when we start to design <coughs> tools, we're trying to think of the context, the situation, the task, and how we can facilitate um, different types of conversation amongst the humans or amongst the... Uh, the and then when they're talking with the agent, um, that might be a different kind of uh, interaction. Great, I might we have five more minutes. Um, so. One or two more questions. Uh, hi, I'm John Rowe from NC State University. And I have a related uh, follow-up to the last question. I was struck by the, the findings about the VISI uh, system and that kind of like more probing and prompting was beneficial. And it occurs to me that there's kind of a trade-off there with an agent that's doing lots of probing uh, with kind of a reduction in student agency in the conversation. Uh, I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are about striking that balance between student agency and how you think about student agency and those types of AI-based conversational systems. When you say student... I mean, uh, letting them take the initiative rather than the, the agent prompting them. I think that's why in our initial design, we, you know, the rule was to let the... Let you know, if there was a long silence to then prompt them, because we felt that that, that was our assumption, that um, they had got stuck. And part of the problem is that they're not, these, uh, in our study, they hadn't been trained to do data analysis. I think if you're well trained, you probably wouldn't need to have that type of prompt, but to encourage uh, them to look at certain parts of the graph, which they may not, it's, it's, a, it, it's an effective um, uh, mechanism. But I think you, you're right, we should, you know, like scaffolding, you should, you know, it's there in, in the process of training and then hopefully you can take it away and that then they get their agency back. 
So I would see it as, as, as a sort of training uh, more than taking, you know, being always there. But in other contexts, it could always, you know, you could always have agents there to prompt, depending on how complex the decision making was. But if you're trying to learn about something, in this case, how to understand those types of data uh, um, visualizations, um, it can be used as a training tool. Hi, I'm Mark Benson from uh, Harvard Business School. I was really curious how you, um, I'm really interested in the boxes and the different devices for um, uh, eliciting feedback. How do you, what's the design process like where you, you decide like how to, what sort of affordances to use and so forth in order to get at what you are trying to get from the participants? A good question because we use a mix of methods. One is to get inspired by uh, the physicality of devices. So to go, we went to the science museums and watched children uh, and observed them using the different interactive uh, exhibits to see what they did with buttons, what they did with, uh, with things like that and, and scrollers. And then I had a very creative designer who uh, was thinking about you know, you need to have a mix. You don't just want to have all buttons that you can just press like that. So, you, and you need to think about spreading them out, but not to have too many questions. So, it's a bit of uh, uh, serendipity. It was a bit of uh, exploration, and it was a bit of um, you know being inspired by how physical devices have been developed in the past. In terms of the actual questions, that was very much uh, in consultation with the teachers or with the educationists about what they were looking for. So it wasn't very, you know, coming just from us. It was they saying, "Well, we'd really like to know more about this and about that." So we we were informed about the specific types of questions by the educationists themselves. Right, I'm mindful of time. And so we will have now coffee for half an hour. Could I please remind the presenters who are presenting at 10.30 to be there at the latest quarter past 10 so we can make sure that the online activities, etc., work. I apologize to the online participants if we didn't repeat the questions. Uh, we're learning still, so thank you very much. Can I again thank Yvonne for an amazing... <laughs>